making a couple of comments first. First, um, you probably all know this, I'm not surprising many of you, but the three individuals who uh, provided our, let, led our music this morning, the, the two men are great nephews of Evelyn Weens, who was one of the great missionary nurses in Papua New Guinea for many years. And the, the lady was the wife of, I believe, the, the brother who played the drums. Um, so what a, what a special symbolic kind of thing is to have the, the family, the relatives of a lady who uh, very literally laid down her life for the work of the gospel in PNG. Secondly, yeah, sure. <laughs> Secondly, I want to thank all of you for the hospitality, for the invitation here, and for what a wonderful experience we've had in camp far beyond getting to share about missions, just the rich fellowship, uh, the teaching, the preaching of the word uh, has been a very special thing uh, for us. It's been a time of, of retreat and um, restoration uh, for us. So thank you so kindly. Nineteen fifty four the highlands of New Guinea. On the shores of the River Kane, little Iguanas was playing with his friends. Their games weren't too different from games children play all over the world, chasing games, wrestling, roughhousing, and climbing trees. Their very favorite tree to climb was the guava tree. The low branches made the climbing easy and the guava fruit at the top of the tree was a, a great treat for the kids. Well, when the fruit had been picked from the low branches, the easily reached branches, the smaller, lighter children had an advantage in going to the higher, more fragile branches. Ioannis, as one of the smaller boys, was sent by his larger friends and siblings to the top of the guava tree where they could still see some fruit. His heart beat faster as he worked his way slowly out onto that thin branch, picking guava and tossing them down to his friends. Suddenly, as he was reaching out for that last piece of guava, he felt the branch beneath him give way and snap. He fell to the ground. The ground was hard and strewn with stones and branches. When his friends got to him, they found him unconscious, bleeding from a nasty gash on the side of his head and with his arm badly deformed. His friends half carried and half dragged him to his father's house. When father saw what was happening, he ran out and picked him up and carried him into the cookhouse and laid him by the smoldering fire. Along the river Kane live the Kuma people. The Kuma is an ancient tribe, an ancient people with a proud tradition. The Kuma have a, a, a belief that they are the only true people. In fact, the word Kuma in the Kuma language means people. So the implication is clear. If you're Kuma, you're people. If you ain't Kuma, you ain't people. The Kuma had a complicated system of beliefs. They believed that they still interacted with the spirits of their dread, dead relatives, spirits who <laughs> their, can... Their dread dead relatives. <laughs> <laughs> spirits who can still influence their lives for good or for bad. Spirits who must be appeased through offerings of animals sacrificed by their graves. They also believed in many spirits, spirits that inhabited water, or mountains, or trees. Any unusual events, they believe, are caused by spirits. When someone becomes ill or injured, certainly when they die, it's important to find the person that has put a spell, has put a curse on the person so that they can punish that person. Sometimes they believe that there must be someone who has hired a professional sorcerer. Sometimes they hire a professional sorcerer who has particular skills in detecting and removing curses. When someone's sick and ill or injured, the 
treatment consists of applying various leaves to their body, sprinkling their body with water, and trying to force them to eat or drink. As Ioannis lay by the cook fire, his aunt ran into the jungle to gather the special leaves that could be placed on the wound, and she bound them there with bush rope, which is a fiber made from the, the pith of trees. His sister found a big banana leaf, and she formed it into the shape of a cup and filled it with water, and she sprinkled water on Ioannis' face and on his chest. His father made a, a simple splint for his broken arm. As the hours dragged on, family members began to gather in. They began to discuss what the possible reasons for were for Ioannis' fall. Who could possibly have wanted to put a curse on this family or on, on this boy? Was it the, the lady in the, in the next village who had been angry because the boys were stealing her pineapples? Or, or the man nearby who had been upset for the boys playing in, their, in his garden? They discussed whether or not they should seek out a sorcerer who could detect the curse, the spell, and remove it. But Ioannis' only response to all of this was an occasional moon, moan and some random movements of his arms and of his legs. His heart beat faster and his breathing became more labored. His belly was swelling. After many hours uh, had passed, Ioannis' breathing suddenly slowed and stopped. The family began to cry. Not the dramatic sh crying, show crying you have to do when someone important dies, but the crying of a family who had lost their, their dear child. But that's how it was in those days. There were no good choices. A road had been built a few years before, nearby, built by foreigners with big machines. And it was said that in a white man's car, one could travel to the city of Mount Hagen, three hours to the west, or to Kundiawa, five hours to the east. And in those cities, there were buildings, special buildings with people who had skills at treating the sick or the injured. But knowing that did this family no good. They couldn't travel. By now, it was night. and. By now, their dear child was gone. A couple of years later, things began to change. There was a rumor that a white couple with a little boy had come to the valley and had built a house near the road. They'd been telling stories about a spirit, a spirit who could bring peace to people's hearts. They'd begun to teach people how to read and how to write. And it was rumored they had medicine that could heal many sicknesses and injuries. This young couple were Wanda and Sydney Knox from America. Sydney was a pastor and Wanda a teacher. Many years earlier, they had felt God's urging to make a difference in their world. Isaiah tells us in chapter 20, verse 21, whether you turn to the right or to the left, you will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way. Walk in it. Sydney and Wanda were listening to that voice, and they had responded by offering themselves to the church for service overseas. They had been assigned to the island of New Guinea, to the highlands. This part of the island had been explored only 25 years before by outsiders. Before that time, the million or so people who lived there didn't even know of the existence of the outside world, and the outside world didn't know that there were a million people living in the middle of this island. Sydney and Wanda had said yes to God's call, and now they had arrived in the Wagi Valley with their prefabricated house, their bag of medicines, and their stories. Stories of a God, not a vindictive God, but a God who loves. It didn't take the Knoxes long to realize that the need for medical help was greater than their little back porch clinic could provide. 
They rejoiced at the arrival of the Condors for many reasons, but one of the reasons was that Mary Alice was a registered nurse. And she had even take, taken um, training, special training in remote nursing to prepare herself for coming to Papua New Guinea. Soon that little backyard, back porch clinic became a bush hut clinic. A young man who lived nearby came to introduce himself. His name was Kintok, and he had just graduated from a training program in the city of Mount Hagen, a program for clinic orderlies, or doctor boy, as they're called in pidgin. Medical assistants who could clean wounds and change dressings and do a dozen simple tasks that would free Nurse Condor to treat the more complicated cases. Soon they started a training program to train additional doctor boy. Well, sadly, first Sydney and then Nurse Condor became ill and had to leave New Guinea. But God provided others to take over the work, including two nurses, Margaret Bromley and from Australia and Helen Bullerjack from the United States. They continued to treat Dr. Bo to teach Dr. Boy and to treat anyone and everyone that came to them. And they also developed a system of outreach clinics for children that are still in use today. Well, as the medical work expanded and the need for health care grew, a dream was born in the hearts of the missionaries and of the community leaders, a dream of a hospital, a hospital that could be built near the village of Kujip a place where the gospel of Jesus Christ could be proclaimed while the injuries and illnesses of the people were being treated. By 1964, the Nazarene World Mission Society, has anybody here ever heard of the Nazarene World Mission Society? <laughs> yeah, it's, the, it's one of the many earlier names of what is now the NMI. But Nazarenes around the world raised over 100,000 U.S. dollars to build that hospital. And in 1965, construction started. In 1967, Nazarene Hospital was opened with a staff of four nurses and one doctor, Dr. Dudley Powers, who is also a dentist. Now, they look like they're standing around having tea, and they probably are, but we've heard that it's a staged photo that they were very, very busy and had to drink their tea very quickly. <laughs> and uh, Brother David said that uh, Dudley Powers was his physician when he was growing up in Oklahoma City, uh, probably after his time in PNG, not before. <laughs> <laughs> Children still run and play by the River Kane. They still climb guava trees, and they still send their younger brothers and sisters to the highest, weakest branches. I was walking home from the hospital one afternoon, cutting between a couple of other houses and across our backyard, when I heard voices, angelic voices, angelic voices speaking pigeon, but they seemed to be coming from the sky. I eventually thought to look up, and there in the top of our guava tree were three very small children, possibly as young as three or four, much higher than I was comfortable seeing them. And uh, at my request, they did come down, and we shortly had that yeah. guava tree removed. <laughs> <laughs> children still fall. Most of the time, thankfully, it's a minor injury, perhaps a, a broken arm that's easily treated. What would have happened if little Ioannis had been hurt in the year 2018? Let's reimagine the story. 2018, the highlands of New Guinea. When his friends ran to Ioannis, they found him unconscious on the ground, bleeding from a nasty wound on the side of his head and his right arm badly deformed. His friends half carried him and half dragged him to his father's hut. When father saw what was going on, he lifted Ioannis and carried him to the house cook, the kitchen hut. And laid him on a grass mat beside the smoldering cook fire. One of Ioannis' aunts ran to the jungle to gather leaves to apply to his wound. 
His uncle ran to a nearby house of a relative who had a car. Carefully, they lifted Ioannis on the mat into the back of the car and drove as fast as they safely could to Nazarene Hospital. When they reached the gates of Nazarene Hospital, they explained to the security man what the situation was, and he opened the gate and pointed the way towards the emergency room. Ioannis' dad lifted him from the car and carried him into the ER. Sister June Lin, one of our nurses, directed them to put him on the center bed. That's the bed reserved for those that are very ill or very injured. It was clear that he was seriously injured. Removing the leaves, she could see that the head wound was deep and losing blood. It appeared that a portion of his skull was fractured and pushed in. And from his swelling abdomen, she suspected there were serious internal injuries as well. She immediately checked Ioannis' vital signs. His blood pressure was low and his pulse rate was fast, both indications of blood loss. She placed an IV to replace the lost blood volume. Doctor, she called across the room, you might want to see this boy right away. Well, we have 11 full-time doctors now at Nazarene Hospital, and any one of them might have been the one to evaluate Ioannis. The doctor, Looks like him. <laughs> well, he looks a bit like me in the pictures. He immediately began to assess Ioannis. He ordered some lab tests and some x-rays. He asked June Lin to make a plaster splint for that broken forearm just to hold it still while they were treating the more life-threatening injuries to reduce his pain. The doctor performed an ultrasound examination of Ioannis' belly and saw the reason for the swelling, there was blood in the abdomen, probably coming from his spleen. That's a common result of injuries in a country where malaria is common. The spleen is often swollen and fragile. Well, after completing the ultrasound, the doctor called Dr. Ben Radcliffe. The <laughs> there are only two missionaries in Papua New Guinea who arrived as early as Dr. Ben and that's his parents, Dr. Jim and Kathy Radcliffe. Of course, Ben was only four years old at the time when he arrived. That's him sitting on his dad's lap there. Uh, now he looks a lot like his dad. Yeah, if you want to look, know what Ben looks like now, just look at Jim. Look at Jim in 1982 <laughs> right. or whatever it was. So Ben grew up on Kujip Station. Uh, when it was time to go to college, he went to Mount Vernon Nazarene University. Then he felt God's call to go into medicine, so he went to finish his pre-med, and he also met Catherine, his wife, who was also pre-med. Um, they went on to medical school and residency, Ben in surgery, and Catherine in family practice. We were thrilled a couple of years ago when they came back to serve at, at Nazarene Hospital. Catherine worked part-time for the first couple of years. She had two little boys, Simeon and Matthias. But a year and a half ago, things got a little busier for, us, for her. She had twins, <laughs> yeah, Naomi and Tabea. So she kind of works out of the home right now. <laughs> but Ben was living his dream, working side by side with his dad. And he's been a real blessing to the work there, both by dividing the surgical work Sometimes Jim was overwhelmed. Many years he was the only surgeon there, and that meant that he was on call every night. And although the rest of us tried to spare him when we could, there were times that there was just nothing else to do but call him in. Now, with Ben there, he could at least have the assurance that every other night he'd be able to sleep through the night. The other blessing of Ben's presence was his more recent training and his ability to introduce uh, some more uh, recent technology particularly laparoscopic surgery. I think you all understand what, what, a, what laparoscopic surgery is, where they make tiny incisions and insert a camera inside the abdomen or other body cavities uh, and perform surgery with instruments passed through even smaller little openings. The first laparoscopic in, uh, surgery in Papua New Guinea was performed November 17th of 2016 by Dr. Ben and Dr. Jim. Well, Ben also examined you on us the ultrasound had shown blood in the abdomen, mostly around the spleen. From his exam, Ben could tell that 
Ioannis had a depressed skull fracture. Both of those were very serious conditions that needed to be addressed in the operating room. Sister Edna was in the emergency room with him, and he called out to her and asked her to call the operating room crew, let them know that there was a surgery to be done. Well, Edna is one of the newest members of the OR staff, and Edna is one of our girls. She's our kid. She's our kid. We're really proud of her. Her mom was our language teacher when we first arrived in PNG, and we loved so much spending each afternoon with Metty that when our time of language training was over, we asked her to work for us as our, as our house helper. So we walked with her and her family through uh, joyous times and hard times, hard times like when Edna's father abandoned the family, and joyous times when uh, Edna, like when Edna was first accepted to and then graduated from Nazarene College of Nursing, for the first couple years after graduating, she rotated through all the departments of the hospital like all the new graduates have to, but all the time she was on the lookout for a chance to work in the operating room, her, her dream job. And now she's working there and doing an outstanding job. So Edna quickly spread the word to the other members of the OR team, nurse anesthetist, a scrub nurse, a circulator, and a supply tech. Edna would scrub along with Sister Vero because she was still new. She began to arrange the instruments across the room. By this time, you want a slab tests. The results were back, showing the severity of his blood loss. The blood transfusion had been started. The x-rays had been finished. It was time to take him to the operating room. In the operating room, Dr. Ben was joined by Dr. Imelda Asego, Dr. Mel, as we call her, she is a part of the Masters of Medicines program that offered by the University of PNG that trains PNG doctors to serve in remote, underserved areas, places where few PNG doctors want to go. And one of the reasons is they, they don't know how to handle the things that they'll come across in those remote areas. From the early days of doctor boy training through the development of the nurse aid program, to the start of the college, uh, the college of Nursing, and now our participating, participation in the Masters of Medicine program, we've been committed to educating young PNG doctors in healthcare and nurses. It's our investment in the future of healthcare in Papua New Guinea. And since we've returned from PNG, we've learned that not only did Dr. Imelda complete the Master of Medicine program and is now working on the staff uh, and is an excellent addition to the staff. But now a new tra trainee has been accepted at Kujip. These trainees live all over the country. Um, and Dr. Melda's husband has been accepted into the general, um, general surgery training program and is able to do the majority of his training there at Kujip. Uh, and as well, Kujip is now a training site for medical students from the U University of Papua New Guinea. So the role in medical education and the preparing of Papua New, Guinean, Papua New Guineans for the future has expanded. Well, this operation went well. Dr. Ben and Dr. Imelda were able to pull that depressed part of the skull fracture, the fractured part of the skull back into place and relieve pressure on the brain. They were able to suture that tear in the spleen without having to remove it as they so often do. Ioannis remained in a coma through the night and for the next couple of days. The day after surgery, the family was visited by one of the hospital's chaplains. Hospital now has five, there's one more than in this picture, two full-time and three half-time chaplains. And they visit the patients every day uh, in the hospital. When the patient indicates that they're a believer, they pray with them and encourage them, Sometimes the patients acknowledge or the family acknowledges that they're backslidden. And the chaplains counsel with them and pray with them to restore their walk with Jesus. In this case, Ioannis' parents had never placed their faith in Jesus, and the chaplain explained the way of salvation. A few days later, they indicated to him that they were ready to give their hearts to Jesus. Over the year, literally thousands of people have given their hearts to Jesus within the walls of Nazarene Hospital. 
About two days after the surgery, Ioannis began to open his eyes. A few hours later, he said a word and then a few more words. By the third day, he was sitting up and soon was walking and eating. A week after his operation, he went home. His parents assured the chaplains that they would be attending the small Nazarene church in their village. Well, of course, this is just a dramatization of a made-up story. I'm always surprised. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I find myself trying to remember more details of when I treated you, Honest. Um, <laughs> But although the story is fictional, every element of the story is absolutely true. And it graphically portrays the difference that medical missions can make in the lives of individuals and of populations and of regions. There are thousands of Christians throughout the highlands, throughout the entire country of New Guinea today because of the work of Nazarene Hospital. Those who were saved in the hospital have gone on to lead others to Christ. Some of them have gone into, the, into ministry. Some of them have gone into nursing. And the word has continued to spread. Let me tell you who is in the pictures here. Um, our cast. Our cast of our, our little drama, as they would call it in PNG. And PNG people love dramas. And some of them don't quite make sense to us English speakers, but this one did to me. <laughs> well, they love when they can have angels in their dramas <laughs> because someone can come in with a sheet, sheet draped over their head and tied under their chin. And that's the angel. Th that's great fun. So they might have been disappointed there was no angels. Except in this sometimes drama. Jesus is portrayed that way too, so it's a little hard to tell. <laughs> In the center there is Ethan Wan. That's the boy that played Ioannis, and that's his mother on the left and his father on the right and his little sister, Jacqueline. No, oh, not Jacqueline. Um, now, are you going to tell, tell them who, you're, who the mother and father are, really, what they do? We, we come across that later. Oh, do we come across that yeah, later? Yeah, okay. Yeah. And then there... Uh, <laughs> but I, I did want to say that the biggest problem in taking these photographs was to get uh, Ethan to stop smiling all the time. He just thought everything was funny and... Uh, um, His two little friends, uh, Zedekiah and something else, Aya, um, also were, were very thrilled to be in this drama. It was, it was a lot of fun for all of us and managed to get enough photographs with a serious expression on the face to make you believe that he was in pain. I think the best part for them was the ketchup on uh, <laughs> Ioannis' head. <laughs> they probably are using that now. <laughs> um, and then in this next picture, let me explain to you why this uh, family was an appropriate choice to be used in this drama and why they're so special. In, in the back picture, that grandpa in the front is Kintok, the first doctor boy that worked with the medical work there. Uh, in the, on the back on the left is Jacqueline, uh, Ethan's mother, who is an a instructor at our College of Nursing. And Kintok's granddaughter. Yeah, and Kintak's granddaughter. And then to the right of her is, is David, uh, Ethan's father, who is our uh, nurse anesthetist in our hospital. And then um, to the right of him is Ethan's great uncle, who is the principal of our College of Nursing. And on his right is his wife, Regina. We um, learned, it's been a few months ago, but uh, Regina has passed away. And uh, I know they'd appreciate continued prayers for their family. And in the front is uh, Regina and White's daughter, who is a second-year student. Emmeline. Emmeline, a second-year student at the College of Nursing. So for more than 50 years, Nazarene Hospital has been showing Christ's love and compassion to the people of the Highlands. But the work started before that. Indeed, the work started with the beginning of the Church of the Nazarene where compassion was made a priority in our church and in our teachings. It continued through the work of the Knoxes and the Condors, the Bowler Jacks. These missionaries and dozens more who came after could testify to the truth of Isaiah 30, 21. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way walk in it. For Andy and me, it was almost 18 years ago that we heard that voice begin to direct us into missionary service 
and to Papua New Guinea, we've continued to listen to God as he speaks in our ear and to, as he assures us that we're walking on the path he wants us to walk on. Now, our story is intended to emphasize to you the value of medical missions, not only in showing compassion to the people, but as a tool for evangelism, as a tool for the gospel. No, we never make the receipt of our compassionate ministry a condition or makes salvation a condition for receiving care. The care is offered freely, but people become responsive when they know you care. And just as the presence of Nazarene Hospital has made a huge impact on the people of the Highlands, so has the presence of Raleigh Fitkin Memorial Hospital made on the people of Swaziland since 1920. And Brazil Memorial Hospital made to the people of Taming Flu, China from 1921 until 1949 when they were forced to close. And so has the Ethel Lucas Memorial Hospital, now called Tinsualo Hospital, which is the local word for grace, from 1930 until the present day, although it was sold to the government of South Africa in the early 60s. And so has Reynolds Memorial Hospital in Washington, India. And then by 1967, Nazarene Hospital in Kujib. For these past few years, our personal circumstances have changed, and we found it necessary to ask our mission leaders for a change of assignment. Uh, it had to do with some health issues and a number of things that came together at the same time. And initially, when we left PNG this time, it wasn't like the other times when we'd leave for home assignment when we'd say, see you later, lock up our house, scratch our dogs behind the ears, one of which was named for John and Lori Watton's son, Mitch. <laughs> um, the, the best dog we ever owned, I think the name has something to do with that. But we would uh, <laughs> leave PNG with full expectation that we would be back there in a few months. This time we said goodbye to dear friends and colleagues we shipped a few personal belongings back to the U.S., and we sold or gave away the rest. In the past, as we've traveled around the USA and Canada, we've concluded our talks with an appeal to folks to pray, to give, and to go. Pray for us and missionaries all over the world, give to the World Evangelism Fund, and go wherever God is calling you to go. Today, we make the same request but we hadn't realized that we would be the people that were going. Initially, we were asked to go to a creative access country, and after we had pretty much completed those plans, we were contacted by Dr. Vern Ward, the global director of Nazarene Global Missions, asking us to consider a new assignment, assignment that would involve working to develop medical ministries around the world and to mobilize. That's that's our, our word for recruit. Uh, we feel that God does the recruiting. Mobilizing is just getting the details in order so they can go. But to mobilize healthcare professionals to go as missionaries to serve around the world. It was not an easy decision for us to make. Um, we had read all we could about the refugees in this closed creative access area, and we'd already given part of our hearts uh, to them. But we prayed and we talked and we prayed and we talked for about a week. And then we just really felt the Lord leading us to... <laughs> and after a week, Judy was finally convinced. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but we felt God was leading us to this new assignment. We'll be working with missionaries and church leaders from all over the world. And we'll have the opportunity to help build ministries that will have a far-reaching and, and long-lasting impact for the gospel. Although we'll be working with our leaders, our global mission team at the Global Ministry Center in Lenexa, Kansas, we're able to work from our home in Nampa, Idaho. And that was a really sweet blessing to us because two of our three kids live in Nampa. Uh, and after all these years of long times of separation, it's been a real joy 
to see them sometimes several times a week. Let me tell you who they are. Um, in the back row is our daughter Amy, um, and then and this is at our son's wedding um, three years ago now. Yeah. That's, a, that, that's the last time we could make them stand up and get a picture, all of them together. <laughs> We're going to get one next week, though. <laughs> and then Andy and I and our son Sam with his, his bride, Cheyenne, and then Drew and Andrea. Drew's our son and Andrea, our daughter-in-law. And then our, our pretty amazing grandson, and his name is Andy. Yeah. <laughs> Andy Bennett. <laughs> and if you're interested, maybe even if you're not, <laughs> we'll tell you why he's so amazing anytime. <laughs> So what can you do? Well, we won't apologize for saying the same things we did a couple of days ago. You can pray for us. Please pray for us as we continue this new kind of ministry for us. Pray that God will give us insights and ideas for expanding medical care, medical ministry around the world. Pray that God will help us to inspire a new generation of doctors and other health care workers to answer God's call to missions. And pray that um, with, for us, as we reach out to those around us, we're used to ministering by going and sitting on the edge of somebody's bed and holding their hand and praying with them. So this is different for us, and we want to do everything we can to minister as the Lord wants us to and to honor him. And, of course, you know what I'm going to say next. You can give. <laughs> Today, there are so many demands on your giving. Even within the Nazarene Church, there are so many ways to give. There are some specialized ministries that raise funds. Many of our missionaries now raise part of their support directly. When the idea of allowing that was first discussed, the fear was that people would give directly to these missionaries and would stop giving to the Global Mission Fund. And the Global Mission Fund is critically important. It's what undermine, underpins, what supports all of our mission work. Without it, there would be no place for those self-funded missionaries to go. So we, we encourage you to not decrease your giving to the World Evangelism Fund. And in fact, the truth has come out that in the churches where most people give to specialized ministries or to individual missionaries, the giving to the Global Mission Fund increases. That's, that's what I expected from Nazarenes. Mm -hmm. I've often used one more example, and again, because of uh, Brother Dave and his former assignment at Bethany First Church, Bethany First Church formed a mission, uh, a, a partnership with the work in Swaziland. Previous to that time, their giving to global... Um, to the, to the um, World, World Evangelism Fund was, I believe, about a half a million dollars a year. They determined, as they began this sponsorship, this partnership with Swaziland, that they would not decrease their World Evangelism Fund. And they have not, even while giving about the same amount toward the work in Swaziland. Those are the Nazarenes that I know and love. And you can go. God may not be calling all of you to go overseas or to full-time ministry, but any of us can go to our families, to our co-workers, to our schoolmates, to our communities. Or even to a far-off place. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way. Walk in it. Now, we don't pretend that everybody can be called to medical missions. In some ways, that would be exciting, but there wouldn't be anybody in the home churches to give to the World Evangelism Fund if that were the case. <laughs> but I do know with complete confidence that God is calling each of us to ministry. And as I commented last night in the missions moment, there's enough call in God's word to keep all of us busy, to keep all of us focused. In addition, God calls many of us in a particular direction to a specific kind of work. 
And if every one of us were obedient to God's word and to God's voice, all the jobs would be covered. There would be enough missionaries. There would be enough pastors. I'd like to ask you to stand, and I'd like to ask our musicians to come back. I trust that we're listening for that voice this morning. I don't understand why God chooses, chooses special moments to speak sometimes. But sometimes he speaks during a time of worship or a time of reflection. I would ask all of you to consider where you are in your ministry, because we all have a ministry. Could God be calling you to something new, something different than you've done before? Maybe God is reassuring you that you're exactly where he wants you to be. This morning I want to open the altars, and I'd like to ask any of you who are thinking about seeking God's direction, thinking about a new call or a new direction, or those of you who are just uncertain as to whether you're going the direction that God would ask you to go in your personal ministry, if you're willing to say to God, whatever it is, I'll go. Whatever you ask me to do, I'll do. This might be a good time for you to come to the altars and and tell God that. We'll let our musicians pray, uh, play. I'm sure they're praying as they play. Uh, for a few minutes, and just make this a time to come forward. Um, your friends or your pastor may come and pray with you. Um, however the Spirit leads. And unless there are any special announcements that need to be made afterward, we'll just allow the service to close uh, when, the, when the music is over. Please go quietly outside and do your visiting outside if people are still praying. And we'll just stay and pray together as long as we need to.